This Week in Microbiology is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at asm.org slash twim. This is TWIM, This Week in Microbiology, episode 274, recorded on September 22, 2022. How about that? I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast that explores unseen life on Earth. Joining me today from Charleston, South Carolina, Michael Schmidt. Well, hello, everyone. How's it going, Michael? We have dodged another hurricane. Unfortunately, the poor souls in Puerto Rico got clobbered by it. And uh, yesterday was the anniversary of Hurricane Hugo Hmm. that uh, clobbered Charleston in 1989. So we all breathe this collective sigh of relief when the hurricanes go out to sea. Also joining us from Ann Arbor, Michigan, Michelle Swanson. Hello. Good to see you all. And is it winter there yet? No. The leaves turned? Um, not really. You no, know, it was, cool. it was like in the 70s yesterday, so we're still having very lovely we- weather. Very good. From St. Louis, Missouri, Petra Levin, hello. Hello. Good to see you again. And we have a returning guest who hails from Tacoma, Washington, Mark Martin. Welcome back. Oh, I'm so glad to be here. I call myself Twim Adjacent, and I can <laughs> <Adjacent. laughs> Yeah. The, the weather here in Tacoma is cloudy and cool. We have a high of 70 today, which is 21 degrees C. And I'm very interested in those numbers because my minus 20 broke and I'm getting it replaced today. So there you go. Um, by, mm. the way, by the way, folks, I just got back from teaching structure and function in microbiology. And, you know, it's really microbial diversity. They just won't let me call it that. So I presented lots of OMG, overwhelming microbial greatness, and WTM, what the microbe? To my micronauts, so we had a lot of fun talking about flagellar dynamometers, uh, pill- pilly lassoing DNA, bacterial switchblades, and zombie mycoplasmas, but I'm delighted to be here. You bring it to life, don't you, Mark? <laughs> I don't know if everyone would agree, but that's kind of you. Before we go into our papers, I want to tell you about a very exciting promotion that's going to raise money for Microbe TV, and that is... If you're interested in celebrating the molecule of the year, the spike protein of SARS-CoV-2, <laughs> and support science education, you can purchase a spike t-shirt from vaccinated.us. All of the profits from sales of this t-shirt during September go to supporting the science programs of Microbe <laughs> TV. So you go there to vaccinated.us, order your t-shirts Put them in your cart, and when you go to check out, use the promo code Microbe TV, and that will let them know to give us the profits. We thank them for including us in this fundraiser and uh, helping us to uh, promote and do our science programs. And will you put that information in the show notes for us, Vincent? I will. I will put a link in the show notes. Great. So that you can uh, go order. These are very cool T-shirts. There's a three-dimensional structure of Spike. Which So Matt is the guy at Vaccinated who contacted me and said, we want to help you guys. We love what you're doing. And he said, we love the spike protein. <laughs> I don't love so the spike protein. but <laughs> Yeah, well, in that sense, you don't love it. But, you know, when, as part of the vaccine, you, you love it, right? I love so, it as part of the vaccine. That's true. I, yeah, that's I, I ordered part. mine already, Vincent. You did? Yeah. Before this promotion? I did it yesterday. You oh, posted use the it promo code. Oh, thank you, Mark. It's very kind of you. Yeah. Uh, I ordered some on the train yesterday as well. Yeah. <laughs> That's kind of me rubbing my own back, I guess. Anyway, thank, <laughs> thank you, Vaccinated. We appreciate Holiday your gifts, support. everybody. Holiday gifts. Holiday gifts. All right. Time for some science. And to start us off with a snippet, Petra will do the honors. So today I am doing this snippet and it's on a paper that was actually recommended to me by my uh, very astute postdoctoral scientist, uh, Dr. Sarah Beagle. And it's on design construction and in vivo augmentation of a complex gut microbiome. It's by Cheng et al. It was published in Cell. And it's really a collaboration between several, a bunch of groups. And it addresses actually a really important problem in the study of the microbiome. So Researchers who study the human microbiome 
um, there's several, I think, hurdles to overcome. First is that you take the human microbiome and you put it into mice. So that's a problem anybody who studies uh, human pathogens, even in a model system, has that you're putting it into a non-native system. But I think more importantly, in terms of studying the microbiome, is that you're left with probably a couple choices. You can take a complex microbiome from human samples, basically a fecal sample, and put it into germ-free mice. So mice, notobiotic mice that are raised in essentially bubbles, they are completely germ-free, and let that colonize, right? But you don't actually know what you have and what's being selected because you're just taking a complex sample and these bacteria in that sample and archaea have not been grown separately. Um, or you can use a minimal microbiome. I think people have used as few as 12 uh, to colonize these notobiotic mice, taking 12 organisms that we know grow in human samples and putting them into mice. But then you, you're not even close to the normal diversity. I think it's over uh, 250, 300 different species that easily are in a lot of these micro, in the native samples. Um, and so you can kind of have this complex system you can't really manipulate, or you can have a minimal system you can manipulate. But the problem with the minimal system, right, is it's not representative. You're not, you don't have different species. And a lot of the niche, niches that are normally filled are not actually uh, being filled in these minimal microbiomes. And so this has been a problem. And, and the authors in this paper, it's really a, um, it's called a resource paper. So it's a paper where they are kind of developing a resource for other investigators to use. So they want to address this problem. And they start, I think, very systematically by identifying um, a hundred, a bunch of species from the human gut um, based on their representation in metagenomic data from the Human Microbiome Project. So this is a project done by the NIH where they sequenced microbiota from different places in the body from many, many people. And in this study, Chang et al., they pick strains that are present in the largest proportion of people. So if the strain A is present in most of the um, volunteers for this project in their gut, then they would pick that one. So they originally start with 166 strains. They trim it down to 104 based on representation. Um, and then, of course, they know this only by sequencing, right, these strains. And so what they want to do is grow all of these in pure culture. So then they have a problem. They have 104 strains. They now need to get all those strains, right? Nobody just has a freezer full of these strains grown in pure culture. So they look in strain collections all over the place and they find, I mean, remarkably 99 out of these 104 um, then they substitute four replacements from the same species. So, you know, these organisms are down to the subspecies identification in the metagenomics. So they replace, I mean, it's a, it's a good replacement, right? They're, they're pretty close. And then they add two additional strains. And I thought this was very smart because they had two additional strains thinking about downstream experiments. And these bacteria that they add are important because they're genetically manipulable. There, there are a lot of tools to play with these strains. So they could, in future experiments, in this minimal 104 species collection, be able to change the genetics in at least a couple of these organisms in a fairly straightforward way, and then essentially probe and see what happens when they change the, you know, the, the genetic makeup. So 104 is about half the number estimated in the average human gut. So it's, it's actually minimal-ish. And most importantly, they're able to maintain all of these guys in pure culture. So hmm. they can grow them. And they actually use two medium, I think, chopped meat broth, which I'd never heard of, and mega medium. Um, <laughs> and they can maintain all of these guys in pure culture. And then when they mix them together, they normalize their prep of mixed things by optical density. So they're adding the same mass, biomass of these organisms. There are a couple they couldn't get to grow to super high density in the two medium, mega medium and chopped meat broth, but they essentially do whatever meat density it's at. It's a very practical paper. They do the best they can and go ahead, but, and they just explain it. Which, so we did this, that's the best we can do. And so I think perfect being the enemy of the good, I think this is all a great way to do things. 
So what, the first set of experiments they do in vitro, so just growing them mixed together, and they find that they're actually really stable. So they grow these organisms, you know, back dilute, grow them, and they find that it's actually a very stable group, these 104, that they're made roughly the same proportion. Um, so multiple repeats, repeats with fresh communities that they sort of put, you know, normalized by OD. When they grow them out, they get the same result, the same proportions over and over again. And they maintain even the low abundance species. So two things that I thought were neat about this were not only was it reproducible, but the low abundance strains, you know, what proportion they were of the population in vitro after multiple repeats was basically the same as the higher um, the variation was the same as a higher abundance strain. So just meaning that there's a lot of you doesn't mean that your amount doesn't vary either. So I thought that was really neat. I also appreciated how the um, systematic approach they took to the um, computational aspect because they needed had to have a method to quantify um, over time each of these species. Oh, so yeah. they take us through um, a lot of detail on how they built their pipeline for doing this metagenomic analysis. Right. They, they do have a beautiful pipeline for doing the metagenomic analysis. They come up with an entirely new way of analyzing it that's designed for this specific set of things. I think one of the things I didn't think about that they talk about is they end up doing metagenomics, so whole genome sequencing, in part because using 16S, so just sequencing this ribosomal subunit, uh, uh, ribosomal gene, basically these some of these Organisms are so closely related, they don't get any difference. So I appreciate that. So the metagenomics was also useful in that way. And there is a beautiful screen, and I don't want to go into it. They, they look to see how these organisms are interacting. They do nutrient dropout screens to see you know, how, if they get rid of one nutrient, what happens to the population, and uh, are some organisms more sensitive but I, th I think that was just a really interesting set of experiments, but it, it's not sort of the main thrust of it. Okay, so they've got the computational method, and they also have, they've established that they can maintain them in culture. Again, this is because if you're going to, say, start doing experiments, you could pull a set of organisms out and start with a lower number, and you'd want to be able to grow those and show, you know, make, modulate what's in the what's in the community. And so it's super nice. So that's in culture. The next thing they obviously want to do though, is go into mice. And so again, they're using these germ-free mice that have no, no organism, bacteria or anything on them. And they put the culture, these, they mix all these 104 organisms together and they put them into the germ-free mice. And then they let the mice do their thing and then they sample to see how stable the community is. And it looked actually a lot like what they saw in liquid culture that very quickly uh, this community stabilized in terms of abundance of all the different species and that it was reproducible. So if they cultured, you know, if they essentially seed the colons of uh, of the germ-free mice once or in a totally separate experiment, they get basically the same proportion. The uh, composition of the community stays the same and the organisms in the community are really stable. So that's super important. The community self-selects. Exactly. It, it effectively sets, sets the number by itself, which drives the microbial ecology that they're all talking amongst themselves, setting their level in the community. And they show this to the reader by this beautiful figure that's in color. And they pick colors that the colorblind <laughs> reader, me, could actually yes, discern. Yes, very important. They are using colorblind friendly uh, figures. And the figures, yes. all of the figures are very beautiful. They have this really nice you know, explanation of how they do it with pictures and colonizing the mice complete with a little tiny mouse and a syringe. It, yeah, the figures are, are excellent. I'm not doing them <laughs> justice. But. Yeah, it's, it's clear that they were, um, that they're doing this as a service to the field. Yes. In the way they explain it, they're very transparent. Their graphics are almost intuitive. It's, it's really it a lovely beautiful. piece of work. They're, they're laying down the gauntlet for others to follow. Yeah. Yeah, they're challenging the the microbiome community 
experimenters. See, it can be done. This is how the science needs to move Right. Forward. I think I also see this, and we can talk about this a little at the end, but I really feel like what they're doing is they're saying, here's a resource, our community, we can now give it to you and you can use it. And we've established all these parameters that are important. So. Mm-hmm. And establishing the sensitivity, the sensitivity of their um, quanti- quantitation method by the metagenomics. I mean, it's exactly. really thorough in their in their thinking. And so they have these 104 and they do this, but they don't stop there. They could have been just like, well, this seems to work. It's stable. But they want to make sure that this community actually is, I think, as representative as possible. So they do, they go to the next level and when they do that, they want to augment and they take an ecology based strategy. So they have these 104 that they essentially picked, you know, in a totally reasonable, logical way based on frequency and, you know, the, the, in the uh, human microbiome project. But, you know, there's often things, other things in there that are there at lower levels. So they want to augment. So they take mice that were previously germ free and now colonized with what they call. HCOM1, Human Community 1, and they give those mice, those colonized HCOM1 mice, um, fecal samples from different human donors, and they essentially do a competition. What comes out in the end? So they have different human donors, and they have all essentially mice that are all the same, starting with this HCOM1. And they see, first of all, that HCOM1 is still very stable. So they, the, the, what their original choice was, was grid. So when they look at the HCOM1 that they've now augmented with fecal samples from different human donors, they see that largely the original community remains intact. There are 97 strains from HCOM1 plus 22 new strains from the donors generally. And there's a total of 119 strains now. So we've gone from 104 to 119. So they've essentially augmented, but they know exactly what those 22 strains are because they had this very stable, uh, reproducible community to start with. So, so their interpretation each- there is, is that the original community left some ecological space available, some nutrients. Exactly. Um, and so they just said, okay, we're going to put another bunch of fecal material in there and let's see if anybody can uh, work their way into that that space that's been left behind left open exactly there was some tiny there were some niches that weren't filled because again they just picked them based on uh, metagenomic data from the human microbiome project and you know they can't imagine all the things that could be happening in the gut so they essentially let nature and natural selection do its work when they put everything together. And now they've filled essentially all the niches they can in theory fill using this kind of cool competition kind of based experiment. And to show that this is not only stable, like if they do the metagenomics over weeks, they see the same uh, essential proportions, the representation in the community of all the different strains is very stable. They challenge with new samples. So They challenged established microbiota in HCOM2, this new community of 119. They challenge it with new fecal samples from different donors, and it's very stable. The community remains stable. And so that means that all the niches are pretty much filled, and it will outcompete any new challenges. They do a little phenotyping, um, so the notobiotic mice, then they are colonized, right? And in addition to showing through metagenomics that they have the same you know, organisms in there and the, free, the distribution is the same, they also look at phenotypes. So they look at when they take uh, fecal pellets, basically mouse poop, and they see what grows, they get the same uh, sort of distribution growing on blood agar. The immune cell profile in these mice is the same. And the metabolomic data, the profile from metabolomics is also the same. And all that says is that the communities are stable and that they are essentially raising the same immune response or lack thereof, and that they are having the the metabolism of all these organisms is also stable. The experiment I thought was really cool and is that if you have a healthy microbiome, it should help you 
because of competition, if you have a healthy microbiome and you have an mitigate the effect of that pathogen because you have all these other bacteria in your and organisms in your gut that compete for nutrients and resources, intestinal pathogen infect you, you should be a- able to at least in your gut. So if this is a good microbiome, right, a stable one and a healthy one in which all the niches are filled, these they reason that they should be resistant to infection with a pathogenic microbe. And what was actually really interesting about the 119 organisms they have is there are no Enterobacteriaceae in there. So no E. coli are in that gut, which is funny because all of us who work with E. coli, you're always like, oh, it's a gut microbe. Um, But here, even after challenging with uh, human samples, they don't have any E. coli. But that's actually great because then they can challenge this HCOM2, this augmented microbiome with pathogenic E. coli called EHEC, entero, uh, 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 entero- hemorrhagic. Hemorrhagic E. coli. Um, and they're, they're pretty nasty to humans. I think they're less nasty to mice. But when they challenge with the E. coli, the pathogenic E. coli, they actually find that the amount of colonization with these pathogenic E. coli is similar to germ-free mice that have been colonized with an undefined genome. So their defined genome is as good at competing out these pathogens as an undefined genome. So I think they kind of ticked all the boxes. It's stable. They can grow all these organisms in vitro and culture. The phenotypes are the same, you know, similar and resistant to pathogenic E. coli. So I thought this is great. What a fantastic, it essentially, the niches at least are filled and enough to make them fantastic resource if you're in the field. And also it, reading the paper, it's so beautiful to people and, and they really do lay it all out there. The problems, the way they've solved some of the problems. And it's just like refreshing to read a paper that doesn't, you know, make too many claims, but like shows you their whole thought process laid out. So I really enjoyed it. Yeah. And this was a collaboration from many different groups who've been thinking hard about microbiome studies from different angles. A number of the groups are from Stanford uh, School of Medicine, also the Chan Zuckerberg Biohub in San Francisco, as well as the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab and UC Berkeley. And I think that covers it, but um, it shows that they all had thought about frustrations they've had with either the literature or their own experimental systems. So they really wanted to push and make sure that this was going to be a reproducible representative model before they share it with the community. And it shows that the microbial world will self-level itself if you give them enough players to effectively do the leveling. You don't get this unnatural distribution of microorganisms. It will reset itself if all the players are present when the game starts. Isn't it open to criticism because you don't have everything there and one could argue whatever you find isn't quite right because of that, right? Well, I mean, it would have to be tested. Yeah. And I think, though, it's... They're going like a huge step farther and Mm. you can always argue that. So the question is, I think they tried to pressure test as much as possible how good this is. The challenge with the EHEC, I think, really says that it is. And then the metabolomics and all of that. I mean, in the end, you know, anytime we do research, right, perfect is the enemy of the good. We try (laughs) to do everything that we can to control as much as we possibly can, but you can always come up with uh, something that could maybe be a problem, right? And so you just try to cover your bases and be as honest as possible. I think that's the other kind of key here. Right. And and to their credit, they end with a section limitations of the study and they name three other areas where they could um, do more work and optimize the system further. But but what a great place to start. So... uh I'd like to make a, a comment if I, if, if you wouldn't mind, Petra. Um, and, and I was, I was driven to this by what, what, what Michael just said about self-leveling and in ecology, there's this idea of climax communities. And sometimes, and certainly in Southern California, where I grew up, there are two different climax communities, depending on, in our case, fires that go through. So I, I agree with the idea that you're going to have a particular strange attractor, for lack of a better word, 
toward a particular population, but I do wonder if there are alternatives to it. It takes us to the idea of, quote, the perfect microbiome. And it may be super complex, but the only way we can get it is steps like this one. Mm. And, and it reminds me a little bit of work that we've done ourselves here. And forgive me, we've lizard cloaca microbiome stuff. The point is we were able to show that really the fecal pellets were not a good measure for what was taking place in the epithelia of the cloaca. But what are we going to do in any study if we don't use fecal pellets? And all I've got to say is the longer they sit out, you get a bloom and new populations in there, even over the space of 30 minutes. So I don't know how else to approach it, but I agree with what you and what Michelle had said that it needs to start somewhere to build on. Right. And I think that's the other question is like, what is a perfect microbiome? I mean, do all of us have perfect microbiomes? Because they're all different. (laughs) So in a way, yeah, exactly. So in a way, I think, you know, this is certainly moving in the right direction. And if you want to do experiments where you take something out or add something, at least you have a a pretty well characters or very well characterized microbiome that you can manipulate. So it's a big step forward in that sense, I think. And then the human beings are all taking uh, pharmaceuticals and the pharmaceuticals can disrupt the microbiome. And, you know, we've covered that paper earlier on TWIM about how if you're on antidepressants, that can result Mm -hmm. in horizontal gene transference. And there was a paper published this month in uh, Environmental Microbiology uh, reconfirming that observation about antidepressants causing perturbations in communities and stimulating horizontal gene transfer. So I think this, as Mark said, is is our first step thinking about climax communities or as I said, the self-leveling Um having tried to block out all the ecology I took in college. (laughs) Um, But um, this is a really cool first step. I I think um, I give them credit for working with chopped meat broth because any of you who have worked with (laughs) chopped meat broth know that the odor is something that is not pleasant, especially after the anaerobes grow especially in the days of mouth pipetting like I grew up in, uh, which definitely drove us to bulbs. So um, it, it, it is something. And I, I sort of had a post-traumatic stress trigger thinking about chopped meat broth when I read this paper. <laughs> Let's move on. <laughs> okay. I wanted to say that I'm impressed that they can keep all these samples separate without mixing them up or losing them. or It's a lot, over 100, right? Right. Are they growing them in little tubes, I guess, right. right? Yeah, they eventually put they put them onto micro tighter, but it, they must keep them super separate and very careful. And that's probably why they did so many replicates to yeah. show that yeah. there wasn't experimental error in, in influencing the result. And they even they had the mice in different cages because um, yeah. we know that there are cage effects. So very yeah, well rigorous. organized. You have to have well organized people to do this. I, I'm very impressed. All right. Thank you, Petra. Thank you, guys. <laughs> okay. Time for our paper from our guest, Mark. All right. I think uh, most of you know I've had a longstanding interest in microbial predation. And, it, you know, I make a joke with students, it's a buggy bug world. But I also am interested in symbiosis and have been all my life. So I recently saw this paper, Defensive Symbiosis Against Giant Viruses in Amoebae, by Art Hoffer, uh, Delafont, Willemsen, Van Hulsel, and Horn, and this is from the University of Vienna and the University of Poitiers in France. And it came out this summer in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. And first thing I would say to you about this is that it has a focus on protists, which are a big interest of mine going way back. And it takes me back to Buchner's book on endosymbiosis. And in that book, you find out that people like Tracy Sonneborn in the 1950s were able to show bacterial endosymbionts in different regions of paramecium. There was one specific for the micronucleus, one specific for the macronucleus, and uh, the cytoplasm in, in general. 
And that kind of factors into what we're talking about here. When I was young, I dreamed of being being able to manipulate these symbioses. Hmm. So that's the one piece of it. And, and the fact that we're talking about protists and we're talking about symbiosis is great. But I'm a little bit out of my territory with giant viruses. I have taught about them. I know that, that in fact, Vincent's a big expert in giant viruses because he's <laughs> talked about this a lot. So I'm going to have to ask him for a little bit of assistance with viral factory here in a little bit. I also think that as we go over this paper, think about the positives and the negatives. And when I say negatives with this paper, there are some techniques that could have been made clearer to the neophyte. Because this is a paper I'm going to assign to my undergraduates. I think you had a question on one of your TWIMs about good papers for undergraduates. And we did a session about that. That's right. That's right. So it starts with the idea in the paper. And I thought that the introduction is very accessible and well stated that viruses, in fact, do shape ecological niches worldwide all over the place. And I remember when people didn't think that. And then, of course, we're thinking about amoebae, which are everywhere. And all living things have viruses. And this is a good example. And they have giant viruses. And giant viruses are of great interest because in some cases, they blur the line between cells and viruses quite well. So the central question they looked at here is do intracellular symbiotic bacteria in amoebae protect against these gyruses, these giant viruses? And they didn't do what I expected, which is to use well-known things. They went to a bunch of activated sludge. I'm really glad I don't work with activated sludge. And so the thing is, they were using a camp amoeba, Castellani, as a surrogate host. And because the language can get a little bit twisty in the paper, I will refer to that as the surrogate host repeatedly. I thought of it very much like an um, indicator bacterium, though, of course, we're talking about amoebae. The supplemental information to this paper is very, very useful. So... I am not a medical microbiologist and never have been, but a canthamoebae can cause disease. And I know that Michael has thoughts on that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we'll All let right. you continue, Mark. I'm not going to expand right. on it. Well, in any event, they went to their activated sludge and they used uh, their surrogate to look for viruses and they found lytic viruses. Actually, I really enjoyed the additional material where they described how to do this. And I'm going to mess up the name but I'm doing my best here. Marseille virus, Vienna virus is what they found because of the, the locations of the different groups. Hmm. And they also isolated an additional acantha amoeba from the same source. And that's acantha amoeba hatchetai. So far, so good. What they found out is that the virus that they isolated was very, very lytic on their surrogate acantha amoeba but not on the one that they had isolated from the same source. And in fact, what they found in the acantha amoeba from the activated sludge is it had a number of environmental chlamydia, paraclamidia, acantha amoebae, they're calling it. And it turns out that there are a large number of them in the literature, and chlamydia aren't just about disease. In this case, they are taking advantage of the intracellular lifestyle by which they live. So this Vienna virus, as they tend to call it, is highly lytic on the surrogate strain, clearing the amoebae within 55 hours. They do say parenthetically that it takes a long time for these things to die. And again, when they want to test it on Hatchetai, they didn't get any kind of lysis. So their first step was something that I would have done, and, and please stop me at any point if you need to comment. They wanted to make some aposymbiotic amoebae. Let's see if we can get that one isolated from the activated sludge and get it to lose its symbionts. And it was very, very difficult. So instead, they wanted to isolate the symbionts and then transfer it to their surrogate acantha amoebae. Now, I will say, and I, I don't want this to sound critical in the slightest, they weren't as clear as they might have been on how they're doing it. What I can determine from context is they're simply adding the isolated symbionts to the amoebae and they're being taken up by endocytosis. They actually even used one of my favorite terms from long ago, multiplicity of infection. (laughs) And that was nice to see. So regardless, they were able to get their um, surrogate organism to take up these endosymbionts. 
And it turns out, long story short, and we can go into more detail in a moment, that now that they've taken up the symbionts, they are now resistant to lytic attack by their by this uh, Vienna, <laughs> Vienna virus. That's so funny. And this is where I want to ask uh, Vincent a couple of questions, if I might. Sure. So what they're say- what they're saying here, I'm used to extremely large uh, gyruses. And, and it looks like the genome of this is about 360 kilobases, which, you know, is bigger than you see in a T even, T even phage. But is that, that's, that's much lower than I'm used to seeing. So I looked into relatives and they're all about that level. Are they using the same techniques for replication that the larger Mimi viruses use? Well, more or less. I mean, there's, that's why they call them nucleocytoplasmic, right? Because, most of them establish a site in the cytosol where they reproduce. So they, their DNA goes there, it's transcribed, you get mRNAs, you get proteins made, and then the DNA replicates, particles are made, all in that cytosolic factory. Some of these viruses are completely independent of the nucleus. Others seem to need something from the nucleus. That's why they have the nucleocytoplasmic name. It's it's you know, and and the giant viruses can be one uh, or the other. So what they need from the nucleus is not clear, but uh, you know, it, it seems to be something early in infection that needs to come out. Maybe it's a transcriptional activator or something like that. Not not really clear. So most they all have this cytosolic. Uh, independence, if you will, but some of them have a little bit of dependence on the nucleus. And it really is independent of the genome size, right? It doesn't matter if you're... So 350 is kind of at the lower limit of the giant viruses, but as you know, it goes over a million base pairs of DNA. It's a big range, but those are all considered giant viruses. It, and it looked to me about about the size of the virion itself is about 250 nanometers. So, you know, they aren't the enormous yeah. monsters, but they tend to have the same general morphology as far as I could determine from relatives. And, and what they do a number of times in this paper is refer to relatives of pretty much everything they're talking mm-hmm. about. So I believe that these are very fresh isolates is what I'm getting at. And, and so there may be a lot that's not yet known. Um, but, in my digging around the last couple of days on this, it uh, looks like they're following up on a number of interesting things. I also want to point out, and it's as is typical for the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, figure one is somewhat crowded. And what's interesting, and I don't know if it's visible to you, Michael, is they are actually able to stain for the um, viral factories, as they're called, which are the subcellular location mm-hmm. in the amoebae where they're constructing these. Um, and they're using the confocal microscopy in in order to do the, the pseudo-colorization. Yes. The images well, are gorgeous. I, I didn't mean... And I didn't mean to cut you off about acantamoeba. I always gross out my poor dental students. Um, the story I tell them is, as you know, amoeba are are grazers in the oral cavity. They they literally are eating our periodontal reservoirs of of microbes. And I asked the kids in class uh, how many of them wear contact lenses and how many of them have ever wet their contact lenses using saliva. And what a cantamoeba causes from a medical perspective mm-hmm. is a cantamoeba keratitis. Wow. And you principally get it. Um, and that's the most common human infection of a cantamoeba. And it's people get it uh, from showering while wearing contact lenses, swimming or a hot tub uh, dispersal from big bubbles and, it's it's far worse than hot tub folliculitis, where you, where you get that rash around your midsection from from the jets. And but in this paper, so, we're finding that the chlamydia have a superpower that they're endowing on their host amoeba. And and that's what I want want to know is whether or not any of these giant viruses or the chlamydia could actually limit the pathogenicity of these acantamoeba. I don't think there's enough 
been studied on acantamoeba and infection simply because they don't cause uh, substantial human disease. No, that's, that's – yeah. So it, it, it was an absolutely fascinating paper and as Michelle pointed out, the, the images are quite spectacular. It's it's funny for me because as I dig through the supplemental material, I want to hear genome sizes and I want to hear techniques for this, and I didn't find them. And this is not a criticism of, of the researchers. I think that they know very, very well what they're doing. And if, funnily said, if I had been reviewing the paper, I would have asked those questions and they would have put a couple of, of, of sentences is for people like me. Um, and that's why I'd like to kind of recommend it to my students, because my guess is they'll come up with the same questions and have to go bird dog them, which I think would be very useful to them. Let's get back to the main melody here. because yeah. It's so cool. It is. It is. And, you know, I don't know about you, Michelle, but I wanted to know so much more than than's in there than is in there. I have to watch my language. <laughs> So in any event, it it is interesting to note that when they transferred these endosymbiotic uh, chlamydia, or they call them parachlamydia, into their surrogate acanthamoebae, it did slow the growth rate normally. And I would expect that because it hasn't fully adapted to the new ecosystem within the cytoplasm of its host. And from everything I could tell, it's just hanging out in the cytoplasm. So, but what's interesting is that even with the slower growth rate, because they can survive the attack by the lytic gyrus, it doesn't matter as much. And they tried experiments where they added the symbionts at different times in concert with or without the virus. Mm. And it worked better earlier as expected. I mean, I think if you're in the middle of a, having a, a viral factory in, in, in service, it's kind of hard to see how it can in, can really have the same kind of effect as when it first, stopped, first started. And what I particularly appreciated is they got suspicious, as I would have been, because they couldn't see exactly how things were being inhibited. So they did some qPCR to ask the question, was replication of the gyrus taking place? And it seemed to show that there was no real increase in the viral DNA, at least early on. And then they did something that I, I fully am happy about. They, they wanted to know whether this was specific for the one particular gyrus that they isolated. And that's what I would have thought. But in fact, a number of gyruses are impacted by the same situation in their surrogate acanthamoebae, which I thought the fact that it renders resistance to a number of gyruses tells me it must be doing something early on in the process of replication. Is that what you got out of it, Michelle? You know, what I what I drew is a parallel to um, macrophages, uh-huh. also phagocytic mm-hmm. cells, Legionella, um, you know. that become activated when they're exposed to microbial products. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, we used to th- we generally are thinking about macrophages and M12, M1 versus M2 activation as like clearly eukaryotic um, uh, special forces. But this paper seems to indicate that amoeba can also become activated by having a bacterial symbiont. And now that gives it um, increased resistance to attacking viruses. I, I, unless I'm mistaken, because I have your textbook, Unless I'm mistaken, and we are using it incidentally, the MAMPs, I was always raised to call them PAMPs, but Margaret McFall and I insist I call them micro- microbially associated molecular patterns. Right. Um, some of those MAMPs are actually intracellular. Sure. And they can be expressed on the, you know, outside of a vacuole, mm-hmm. et cetera. So I think amoebae are fascinating for this reason. And I wanted to add something else that I'm not sure is as important to everyone here as it is to me. These amoebae are eating E. coli. Oh, yeah. And so my thought is they're grazers. Mm -hmm. So are they taking up residence in there? What's special about the paraclamidia in this sense? Mm -hmm. Although the chlamydia in general have all these really cool strategies for taking advantage. Like they, they can suck up ATP from their host, et cetera. Um, but it was a really interesting. And, and um, I had to dig around to see what I could find out. And it looks to me like this paraclamidia, and it, they have a, a figure that shows this 
is pretty similar to the other paraclamidia that they know, also found in amoebae, um, and, but a pretty good-sized genome, about three megabases, um, want to say 2,600 genes. And I, I really want to know what's being expressed in those symbionts and, and, and how is that affecting what's taking place. So, Mark, you said that symbionts decrease the replication of the amoeba, right? So yes. They're, they're exerting a fitness cost. So are these maintained in nature or are they transient? So really good question. And, and it's fascinating to me because you can't take the uh, one that's isolated from the sludge and make it aposymbiotic to see if its growth rate increases. Mm. So what I tend to look at, and it might be a blind spot in my brain, is I want to believe that they've been kind of Darwinoed so that they're able to survive in that new environment effectively. And then when you introduce it into a new host, it's going to be quite different until that Darwinoing happens again. Yeah, pathogen. I mean, also the resistance to virus infection may be a big advantage, right? Even you may lose a little fitness, but if you survive virus infection, yeah, it's good. You're fit. There, there are approximately a gazillion viruses in the in the water, correct? In the ocean, many gazillions. Well, yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And and growing slowly is a selective advantage, especially when you're in a very competitive environment like like yeah. slugs. And that's the other part I wanted to mention. They meant <laughs> too many mentions. They stated in the paper that the activated sludge was known to be rich in these giant viruses. Mm. So because of the general, okay, the seeming generality of inhibition of giant virus growth, this is going to be super important for that environment. Um, and the question is how, you, you, you know, when we first, when gyruses were first discovered, they thought they were very specific to particular areas and we're finding them everywhere. So I'm suspecting the same thing. Um, can I add mm -hmm. two more points? Mm -hmm. So first off, they they make this comment that made me laugh out loud last night as I was writing it down, that amoebae can be seen as evolutionary melting pots, mm -hmm. facilitating gene transfer between bacteria that live inside them and viruses because they're all in the same package, for lack of a better term. And I thought that might seem flippant, but it's certainly something that stays with me. In addition, and this takes me way outside my wheelhouse, though I love the concept I, I think about Wolbachia, and I think about how it can inhibit the way the dengue virus replicates. And that way, with the release of, the, of, of um, mosquitoes carrying this strain of Wolbachia is thought to cut down on dengue. And then as I dug into that, I found out that there's some evidence that some types of Wolbachia can give host aphids resistance to parasitic wasps. Mm -hmm. So this idea of some kind of symbiotic bacteria exerting this important um, phenotypic change in the host in a way that benefits it is apparently, to borrow again from Michelle, a symphony that's played often. Yep. Well, I'm reminded of back when the first episode of Star Wars came out and Rita Colwell got up at a national microbe meeting and introduced metachlorians as <laughs> bacteria, the, the entities of the force. And as I read this paper, I was reminded of what Rita was saying about the metachlorians and thinking that the chlamydia in this case are effectively telling the giant viruses, pay no attention to this amoeba. This is not the virus. This is not the amoeba that you want. And the, the metachlorian or the chlamydia in this particular case is actually conferring the benefit of the force as Obi-Wan was raised <laughs> his hand saying, these are not the droids you are looking for. That's effectively, this is not the amoeba you are looking for to yeah, the giant and, virus. And um, the first author, Patrick Arthofer, um I've corresponded with, and he thinks that um, because viruses are so, are, are protists, have so many intracellular symbionts, it could be an indication that um, viruses are a major selective force mm. and therefore widespread an advantage. And that's why it's rare to find a protist without an, a symbiont that's perhaps conferring this mm. force. So Patrick is a PhD student in Matthias Horns' group there at the University of Vienna. He grew up in the most southern county in Austria, 
and then moved to Vienna to study microbiology and earned first a bachelor's and a master's uh, before joining the Horns Research Group to study these giant viruses and microbial symbiosis and evolution. He loves testing hypotheses in the lab, is amazed by the diversity of strategies that cells use to defend against viral infections, and also the way some viruses can circumvent those defenses. He says it was just super exciting. He remembers vividly the day that he, Vincent, and Matthias uh, discovered that by transferring the um, chlamydia symbiont into a new host, um, um, a canthamoeba, that was sufficient to block infection or replication of a, of a virus. So he also, in addition to um, science, loves music. And since his teenage years, Patrick's been playing the guitar in various bands. And as you can imagine, he is so happy that now with the pandemic calming down, he's able to, again, play and with um, other people and go to concerts. Cool. So, Mark, yeah. there is... I'm thinking about the Wolbachia. So the Wolbachia is a very well-known endosymbiont that can impact some viruses, but in in mosquitoes. So I'm not sure that dengue has a negative effect on mosquitoes, right? It has no. a negative effect on the people that it infects. But I'm not sure what the ecological significance of that is, although some over 50% of insects in the world have Wolbachia endosymbionts, right? Um, yeah. There, there obviously is something else because it has a it, it imposes a sex bias as well on the mosquito, right? So there's something else. But I think in terms of the antiviral activity, I'm not as sure as here as in this example. These amoeba are protected from being killed by the endosymbiont, and that is a clear advantage uh, against the virus. So I, I think this, uh, the ecological significance of this is, is clear, whereas sure. less so for Wolbachia in terms of viruses, but maybe something else is doing. Is that, does that make sense, what I'm saying? Absolutely. I, I mean, I don't know enough about the viral factories to know with, if it's been worked out stage-wise what's taking place when. And with Wolbachia, but- you mean? No, I'm talking about your giant no, viruses. No, we don't now. know. We don't know. I mean, what these bacteria are doing, nobody has any knows. I mean, I think that would be interesting to sort out, right? What the mechanism yeah. of inhibition here? Yeah, they point out that that we know that the viruses are everywhere in the water. Yeah. We know that endosymbionts are very common, and and nobody has systematically looked at the impact of one on the other. So this is going to be a landmark. Paper. It's the old story because it doesn't affect humans, so it's harder <laughs> to get money to do the work, right? But the the parallel to macrophage activation, I think, is fascinating. Yeah, that might be. Yeah. The... Oh, absolutely. And Legionella. Yeah, of course. And Legionella. <laughs> Don't forget. Or in amoeba. Yeah. Or in the yep. amoeba. Yeah. Yep. So the question is, yep. can Legionella prevent viral infections of amoeba, right? <laughs> yep. And I- Yes, that I is think the Matthias question. And his colleagues are in a position to ask that question, but of course they've got chlamydia already working beautifully. So, no, it was a great <laughs> question for Legionella. I think that that would be, and there you have a uh, a human factor there, right? So you could get that funded. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, I love it. You could Very get cool. that funded. Yeah, I love when when these things go beyond the the actual findings. Hmm. And, and I think in terms of symbiosis, I mean, I, I make a joke that we, we have peripheral symbioses, say like the bobtail squid and, and vibrio fisheri, and then we have mitochondria, which are fully integrated. But what I love about this is you can establish a new symbiosis. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And from what I'm, what I'm, 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 what I'm gathering, you just dump them onto the amoeba and they take them up. Is, is that sound yeah. about right to you, Michelle? Yeah, the amoeba are phagocytic. They'll eat anything. Yeah. What the chlamydia do is avoid being chewed up, right? Yeah. They can set up little replication I mean, vacuoles. that's why they're mixing yeah. vessels, because they eat everything, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. And yes. so I love the idea that this is the kind of, of, of symbiosis that you can establish, even if you can't make ap- aposymbiotic ones easily. You can still establish them in other um, surrogate organisms. And I think it's such a wonderful way to approach the issue of symbiosis which isn't about medicine. Well, here's another question for you. What came first, the macrophage or the amoeba? <laughs> or did the amoeba 
evolved from I macrophages. Think, I think amoeba are more ancient than macrophages. I think yeah. so too. Single cell yeah, organisms. I do too. Yeah. I, I have a soft spot for them. They're so cute. <laughs> Not when they. <laughs> yeah. Until they, until okay. they get in your, in your brain. Eye. You don't want them in your brain. You're absolutely right about Nagleria and Acanthamoeba. You're <laughs> absolutely right. But I, growing up, I used to look at, at Oloxima carolinensis all the time. I love those giant amoebae. They were wonderful. I'm. <laughs> You're lucky you made it to adulthood. Oh, fascinating. Very you could have been eaten. Or co-opted. Maybe I'm symbiotic with them, Michael. Well, hopefully. Anyway, thank you. Hopefully. Thank you, Mark. That was great. I, I really like that system, that story. Very good. All right. Uh, that is TWIM274. Show notes are at microbe.tv slash TWIM. Questions and comments, TWIM at microbe.tv. If you like what we do, consider supporting us. You can buy a T-shirt, a Spike T-shirt. But if if you don't like spikes... And I get that. Uh, you can go to microbe.tv slash contribute. And there are other ways that you can uh, help us out. Did you know, folks, that if you go to smile.amazon.com, for example, you could designate Microbe TV as your charity of choice. And uh, a fraction of your really? purchases go to us at no extra cost to you. Put that in the show notes, too, will you? I will. And you know what's interesting we have got 450 bucks so far from smile.amazon.com over the past year. Um, just, a, you know, a few pennies from everyone's orders. But you do have to go to smile.amazon.com. You can't just go to amazon.com. It's You have to do it via the smile. Smile. And the apps don't work on your phone. You have to go to the website. It's like a little bit inconvenient. But if you're, if you're so inclined, we'll put the link in the show notes for that as well. Our guest today... Mark Martin, the University of Puget Sound. Always a pleasure, Mark. Thank you. Thank you. And the, the I don't know if you're a Lovecraft fan. Of course, I know that. Do you know the story with the pump, the guy in the room with the pump that's keeping him alive? It's keeping the room cold. You're talking about the uh, short story Cool, cool Air. Air. That's what the noise in your background reminds me of. That's It keeps me, well, alive is the wrong word, as you recall from that story. Yes, yes, I do. Uh, I, Undegraded. 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 <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Michelle Swanson's at the University of Michigan. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. See you next time. Michael Schmitz at the Medical University of South Carolina. Thank you, Michael. Thanks, everyone. And Petra Levins at Washington University in St. Louis. Thanks, Petra. Thank you, guys. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I'd like to thank the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIM and Ronald Jenkins for the music. This episode of TWIM was edited by Ray Ortega. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you next time on This Week in Microbiology. Microbiology.